up? My name is Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here at New Mountain Church. Uh, really glad to see you guys. Uh, just we get to open up God's Word today, and I'm very excited about that. Every time Sunday comes along, I'm just super excited to do that. I know some of you are like uh, super excited for food after service. Well, me too, but God's Word's better than food. Uh, it actually says that, doesn't it, in the Bible somewhere? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, if you're a new to New Mountain Church, uh, welcome. We, we love to have you here. Uh, new Mountain Church has to do with the Bible big time. That's a big emphasis at New Mountain Church. And also the community atmosphere, like the family atmosphere. Those are the two big things at New Mountain Church. And today, I mean, we're going to have so much Bible today that if you're allergic to the Bible, you might die. You might <laughs> If, if you just can't handle the Bible, your brain might explode, but it's okay because we've got buckets and mops, and so it's all good. Everything's good. Everything's good. But I'm, jo- I'm not joking. We're going to go through a whole bunch of stuff today. It's going to get crazy. We're going to go fast, though. Denise, you ready with your finger to go really quick? Because we're going pretty quick today. But first off, I'm going to start this with a question. Do you talk to Jesus? Amen. Well, Tammy talks to Jesus, but does anybody else talk to Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's awesome. So, like, what do you say to him? Thank you. Thank you? That's awesome. I love you. Yeah, amen. What else? Help? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Help. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that, yeah. So talking to Jesus is a, is a, a good thing. It is definitely a good thing. Uh, if, if you think about the story that we have been looking at, last Sunday, it's when Jesus kind of meets these two guys on the road to a town called Emmaus. And these two guys are like totally like just beat up, downtrodden. They're like upset. You know, they're like sorrowful because because they have been a disciple of Jesus Christ. And they've learned from him and they heard about him and they met him and they're with him. And then then he goes to the cross and he's crucified. And so they're like super bummed out. Like they're, they even said it in Scripture. They thought, we thought he was the one to redeem Israel. Like they were super upset. And they're just like moping as they're going home, right? But then Jesus comes up, you know, kind of incognito. He comes up and he's walking with them. And Jesus asks them a question. He says, he says uh, what is it that you guys are talking about? And they're like, where have you been? Under a rock? You know, they're like, Jesus, our Jesus, he's crucified. But he keeps asking them questions. And why did Jesus ask them questions? I think he obviously already knew exactly what they were thinking, but he wanted them to talk. He wanted them to verbalize it. Jesus wanted to hear from them. In the same way, Jesus wants to hear from us. Like we need to be talking to Jesus. Some of us talk to Jesus on Sunday mornings, and that's it. And then the rest of the week, it's like, No thanks, Jesus. I'll talk to you on Sunday. Uh, I'd like to promote that we talk to Jesus every day of the week. Uh, The title of the message today is Opened Eyes or Closed Eyes. That's one of the two options you have as a human being. You can have spiritually closed eyes and you can't see the truth of God. Or you can have opened eyes. And you could really see. Last week's message title was either you're going towards Jesus or away from Jesus. Today's title is you either have opened eyes or closed eyes. There's not really any in between. There's really not any in between. So we're going to jump into scripture. If you got two legs, let's stand up. Let's praise God by honoring him, by standing up as we read through God's word. This is Luke 24, 22 through 22. 35. If you need Bibles, there's Bibles on the back, and you can take them home. You don't got to put them back. Don't worry, your house will not burn down if you bring a Bible into it. So Luke 24, starting at verse 22, says this, Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not, fin- it, they did not find his body, they came back saying that they, ha- that they had even seen a vision of angels. Uh, who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said. They did not see him. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as, he, as if he was going to go further. 
But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. And he went in to stay with them. And when they were at the table with him, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and he recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he opened up to us the scriptures? And they arose that same hour, and they returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathering together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay, let's pray, everybody. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we can spend together, Lord, as family, as a community, as a fellowship. And we can open up your word, Lord. I pray that that we would understand what happened in your story, Jesus. I pray that we would be able to see ourselves within the characters in these stories. Lord, this story is not a fictional one. It's not make-believe. It's not myth. It's completely true. It's eyewitness testimony. And I pray, Lord, that our lives would be lived in light of that testimony. So help us today to be on fire Christians, really, really passionate, really, really strong Christians in a world that's ever growing darker. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Pray that you be with us today in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, you may be seated. You may be seated. So as we see the recap of what happened, we saw that Obviously, Jesus was crucified. He's put in the grave. Uh, Three days later, he's risen. The women, they run to the grave because they're supposed to do the burial ceremony, the burial spices. And who do they see? They say the angels. They see these angels there. And the angels are actually surprised that the women didn't understand that he needed to be crucified. They're like, what do you mean? Didn't you hear the words of Jesus? He said that he was going to have to die. He said he was going to have to go to the grave to actually complete his purpose and so the, the the women now they run back to the guys and they, they tell them and even the john and peter they run to the grave and they look for themselves and they find the, the tomb empty and then the story moves on to these guys walking this road to emmaus let's look at what happens Verse 22, Moreover, some women of our company amazed us, and they were at the tomb early in the morning, and and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels. Again, I talked about last week that the angels, do you know why they were glowing? They were glowing because they came from the presence of God. As Moses came down off the mountain, his face was glowing because he was in the presence of God. There's something about being in the presence of God that just illuminates your soul and comes out your pores there's something about it these angels obviously were were different than just regular human beings and so these these women they come back they say oh he's alive verse 24 says some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said but they did not see him jesus was not there as we're going to see jesus reveals himself to some as the guys are walking the road to Emmaus, they're, uh, like I said, they're pretty upset. Right? The one who they thought was going to change everything has now been put in a grave. But they even said, yeah, but then some of the women, they said that they went there and he wasn't there. Some of the guys say they went there and he wasn't there. But yet they still didn't grasp it. There was still something that was confusing them or blurring their spiritual vision. And I think... Those guys, all the way back there, all those years ago, are not unique. I think there's people today that might have gone to church their whole life and still have blurry spiritual vision. They don't really truly understand Jesus. They don't truly see Jesus for who He truly is. In fact, some, of, some people, they don't really think the Bible is what the Bible is. Some people out there have Dalmatian theology. Do you know what that is? A big theological word. It means they believe spots of the Bible. They believe the Bible in in just spots, in just sections. They don't believe the whole Bible. They just believe a little bit of the, the Bible. They got Dalmatian theology. 
God's word is God's word. Jesus is Jesus. And so we really need to see God's word for what it is. And God's word points us to Jesus. The whole of God's word points us to Jesus. It all points us in that direction. So as they're walking to this place called Emmaus, Jesus is asking them these questions. They say this. They say all these, these, these things that they're upset about. And then what does Jesus say? Verse 25. He said to them, O foolish ones! and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Now he chastises these guys for not understanding it, for not grasping it. Not in a way that he's being mean or he's being, you know, uh, overbearing or, you know, heavy-handed. It's like this. What if you had a friend and you were close to this friend and this friend was doing something in their life that you knew was going to lead them to maybe death or imprisonment? What would you do? Oh, They'll figure it out. No, they probably won't. You need to say something, right? That's your friend. You need to say, hey, stop what you're doing. Look at what you're doing. Why are you doing what you're doing? Like your friend, if he means that much or if she means that much to you, you would say something. He says to them, foolish ones, don't you get it? Haven't you seen it? Haven't you read about it? All that the prophets had spoken. Verse 26 says this. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And he doesn't stop there. As they're walking, he breaks out in Bible study. Next Bible study for New Mountain Church, we're going to walk somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, nobody's going to show up. It's going to be me and my Bible. Okay, we'll walk it. We'll walk it, yeah. But he says this in verse 27, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he breaks out in Bible study. But he just doesn't break out in one section of one part of the Bible. He says, nope, beginning, at the beginning, I'm going to show you who Jesus is. Beginning in Moses. Which books did Moses write? The first, the first five. But which, which one are they? Which which. Nice, nice, nice. You guys got it, you guys got it. So he's beginning at the beginning of the Hebrew Bible to show them the reason that Jesus needed to go to the cross and die. Now, Jesus told them that the problem was not in their head, but maybe in their heart. It's a heart problem. It's not a literal heart problem, but, but in the ancient day, they would look at the heart as the seat of the passions, of the desires, the seat of your, your purpose in life, your will. I mean, there's so many people that I know that have very intelligent brains, but hardly any heart. Their heart's like, little, little tiny guy. But their brains are big, but their hearts are just like, they don't have any willpower. They don't have any gumption. What's that one Italian word? They don't have any... Chutzpah. Chutzpah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Yeah. They're just kind of like... Eh. Right? They're kind of vanilla. You know, I don't know how... They, like, they're just like... They're missing something. They need, to, they need some heart workouts going on. Right? They need to have their will and their... What they're passionate about to be on fire for the Lord. Now, keep in mind, the Bible is very clear that the mind is completely and utterly involved in your belief in Jesus Christ. It is. In fact, it says that Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Okay? The mind has to be changed. In fact, that's the whole idea of belief and, you know, coming to Jesus. There's a mind change that takes place. Where you start to realize, you start to understand, but it's also even past the mind, and it gets into the heart. And this is where some people miss it. This is what it says in Proverbs 3, 5-6, through 6, a very famous passage. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. With your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your mind. Trust in the Lord with all your abilities. Mm. trust in the Lord with all your bank account, trust in the Lord with all your wisdom, trust in the Lord with all your heart, your will, your purpose, your life is in there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will snowplow style make your path straight. 
easy way to have a curvy path in life, to have a bunch of stumbling blocks in your life, is to not acknowledge Him, is to not trust Him. That's an easy way to get a clogged up road in your life, spiritually. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. There's something deeper than just your mind. That's why at New Mountain Church, I keep saying, like, like I'm just calling for people to, to really trust God, really, really know God. Because I think that there's some places, some people out here in church is that, that they worship a Jesus that they don't know very well. I want us to be a church that gets to know Jesus really well. Let's know him really well. Because once you really start to have spiritual eyes, you can't take your eyes off of him. You get all the way on board. You get all the way on fire. Last week I talked about, you know, we all have this spark of the Holy Spirit in our life. And I feel like some people, they keep their Holy Spirit really small, really small Holy Spirit in there. But yet the, the Bible calls us to be on fire for the Lord, meaning to be our whole life is used up for the Lord. It's our, everything that we're about has to do with the Lord. That's the difference. New Mountain Church is also going to be a church always that is heavy on community. And we love people and we talk to people and we care about people and we help people and we disciple people to look more like Jesus and less like us every day. And then one last thing, there's the Bible component, right, to New Mountain Church, right? Bible, people, that's God and people, those are the only really things that matter in life. Well, the Bible component is sometimes going to be difficult. Some people don't like going to church where they have to think. And there's a whole bunch of other churches out there. Don't worry about it. I love you. But New Mountain Church is always going to be a theology church. You know what that is? You know what theology is? Anybody know? The study of God. It's a study. It's a continual journey to learn more and more about Him. It's a journey that never ends. If you get to the end of your journey learning about God, you've actually went off the path and you are now in a ravine. The study of God never ends. It only gets broader and more enlightened and more interesting and more awesome. In fact, it's like this. Christianity is beautiful. The Bible is awesome. And it's because it almost is like a public swimming pool, minus the floaties. It's like a public swimming pool. Because to come to know Jesus and to understand the Bible, it's so easy. My granddaughter can do it. Kids, the kids in the kids' area, they're learning about Jesus and they can grasp it. They can get it. Getting in the pool is very easy. But as you grow as a swimmer, you can always swim out a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and swim down and see more and more and experience more and more of the pool. Problem is, or that's not a problem, it's actually a good thing, but the good thing is, This pool I'm talking about, you know, the understanding of God, it never has an end. You can continually journey after God and never fully grasp it. As I said, New Mountain Church will always be a theology church, so I'm going to hit you with a theology word. You guys ready? Hey, no, please, no. Okay, here we go. Christophanies. Anybody know what those are? Christophanies? That's not the uh, 67th book of the Bible. No, it's not that. A Christophany is a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ in the Bible. Pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. Think about this. As they're walking on this road, Jesus opens up to these guys all these scriptures pointing to Jesus. But he says, starting from Moses. So, hey, Denise, you ready? We're going to go crazy fast for now. You ready? Get your, work out your finger. One, two, three. Okay, here we go. How about this? Starting way back at the beginning, Genesis 3. The seed of the woman whose heel was bruised. That's a picture of Jesus Christ, right? Why was his heel bruised? Anybody Bible nerds, you know why? Why was his heel bruised? Because he was crushing the head of the serpent. Jesus will always be victorious over Satan. 
So that's the Genesis 3. How about this? The blessing of Abraham to all the nations in Genesis 12. Or how about the high priest after the order of Melchizedek in Genesis 14? Or the man who wrestled with Jacob in Genesis 32? You know who that man was? Jesus! Okay, how about this? The lion of the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49. Who's that lion? Jesus! How about the voice from the burning bush? Did you know that that is Jesus? That's Exodus 3. How about the, the Passover lamb in Exodus 12? The prophet greater than Moses in Deuteronomy 18. Yep. How about the captain of the Lord's army in Joshua 5? That captain was Jesus. Okay. How about the ultimate kinsman redeemer? Jesus. If you're ever in a Bible study and you don't know the answer, just say Jesus. You'll always be right. <laughs> How about the son of David, a king greater than David in Psalm 110? Jesus. How about the suffering Savior, Psalm 22? The Good Shepherd, Psalm 23? The Wisdom of the Proverbs? The Lover of Song of Solomon. Nobody ever wants to preach on that book. (laughs) The Lover is Jesus. Yes, you're right. How about the Princely Messiah in Daniel 9, 25? This Princely Messiah, he would establish a kingdom that that would never end. There is no king alive or dead who has ever, ever established a kingdom that will never end. Only Jesus. Okay, how about this? How about this? The anointed one from Daniel 9.26. Yep. This anointed one in Daniel 9.26, it says that he will be killed and it will be under the appearance of not accomplishing anything. Think about as Jesus goes to the cross, everybody's like, oh no, it's over. Jesus is dead. He's dead, right? Everybody's so... But that, that was the whole purpose of God. It was kind of like the lull before the crescendo, right? It's, you, even the, the earth and the sky darkened and thunder and earthquakes and, and Jesus took his last breath, right? And everybody just... But then the third day, bam! Right? Just, he's, a, he's showing up to everybody. Even Thomas is feeling the, the, the holes in his wrist and in his side. How about this? The Savior described in the prophets. How about the suffering servant in Isaiah 53? Okay, well, let's look at Isaiah 53 just so we can really grasp some of these Old Testament prophecies of Jesus. Okay, let's look at this. Isaiah 53 says this, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But, verse 5, He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Who does that sound like to you? If you can't see the story of Jesus in this Old Testament Bible verse, I don't know what to say. This section of Isaiah was written 800 years before Jesus showed up. There had never been anybody that fit that criteria. Somebody that was beaten for your health. Somebody that was, that was chastised. Somebody that was in sorrow. Somebody that was weighed down so that you could be set free. Nobody in all of history ever met that criteria except for Jesus Christ. Okay, that's Isaiah. Let's move over to Zechariah. Zechariah 12.10. It says this, Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. And they will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as the only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as a firstborn son who has died. Through Jesus on the cross, we are healed. Through Jesus on the cross, we have the spirit of of Christ in us. Zechariah 12.10, that's 500 years before Jesus is on the scene. How many do you need to see 
How many Christophanies do you need to understand in the Bible? Christophanies are all throughout the Bible. In fact, the whole Bible is all the story of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Every single part of it. All of the Bible should be pointing you to Jesus. In fact, to understand the Bible, you have to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that points you to Jesus. And so when you really see that the Bible is completely and utterly and all about Jesus, your eyes become clear. You start to see. You start to have spiritual understanding. Now, think about it like this. Moses, right? The book of Moses, or the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. The books of Moses foreshadowed Jesus in the Old Testament. The, the prophets in the Old Testament prophesied Jesus. The gospels in the New Testament revealed to us Jesus. The epistles in the New Testament, it taught us about Jesus or explained to us Jesus. And then revelation in the Bible, it did what for us? Bam! Promised the return of Jesus. Revealed is pretty close. The whole Bible is all about Jesus. Old Testament foreshadowed Jesus. The Gospels revealed Jesus. The epistles explained Jesus. And then Revelation shows us that Jesus is coming back again. This is not over. This is not done. The story's not finished. But there's many Christians who are living lives like the story's finished that nothing's ever going to change, that everything's just going to be the way it's always been, that their life or their, their journey towards Jesus, it's, it's got to a plateau. Do you know what that means? You're not going up anymore. <laughs> you're not going down, but you're definitely not going up. You're just stuck. You're living a mediocre Christian life. Do you think that that's a good thing to do? Uh, in a marriage, do you think it's a good thing to have a mediocre marriage? <laughs> Why would we honestly think it's okay to just be kind of eh when it comes to Jesus and the idea of who he is and the scriptures that contain him? And Why do we think it's okay just to be lukewarm or, or to be vanilla? I mean, I like vanilla, but like vanilla is just kind of vanilla, right? It's just plain. If you want plain ice cream, you get vanilla, right? We should not have plain spiritual lives. But when you look out here in this vast number of Christians in this town we call Yuma, it just seems like there's not a whole lot of life. Everything just seems kind of regular. Do you think God wants regular worshipers? Halfway soldiers? I don't think so either. I definitely don't think so. So Jesus says he's with the guys. He interprets the scriptures. In other translations of the Bible, it says that he expounds the scriptures. And that's what any pastor should do. If you ever go to any church, if the pastor is not expounding the scriptures, that means if he's not just explaining to you the scriptures, or a better way to put it would be like letting the, the, letting the Bible speak for itself. If the pastor's not doing that, there's a slight malfunction. It should always be where... We're just explaining the scriptures, laying it out. That's why we have a pulpit here. It's because it shows the centrality and the importance of God's open word. And so this is what we're doing. We're explaining what the scriptures say. That's why we go verse by verse through the Bible. I know that it's okay to, to bounce around a little bit, but, but I think it's a great thing to do to go verse by verse explaining what the Bible says. Luke 24, 28 to 29 says this. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted, as, he acted as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. So they don't know he's Jesus, right? But yet they want him to stay. They want to continue talking to him. Yeah, yeah. They knew there's something about him, right? Wow. So if we have the Spirit of God in us, why aren't people wanting us to stick around? <laughs> Maybe some of you, they do really like you to stick around, but I think it should be, should be something that we should aim towards. That we are going to follow what the Bible says and actually be salt and light to this world. 
Why would the Bible say we, need, we, sh- we should be light to this world? Because so many are in, are in darkness and we should be illuminating their life, right? Illuminating that for them the truth, right? Sure, for sure. Okay, why would the Bible say that we should be salt? It, it's, I heard of a few different things and they all kind of work together, but yes, it preserves, but it, don't only, it doesn't only preserve. You don't put salt on your french fries because you want to preserve your french fries. You put salt on your french fries because you like the flavor of it, right? But it, it does preserve. If anybody in this room is ever old enough to go through the Great Depression, you might know if you want to keep your meat from rotting, you put it into salt because salt preserves. It slows down corruption. That's what Andrew said. Slows down the corruption of the, of the meat. Why would, why would we be considered salt if it's it also heals. That's good. That's good. So the Christian should be somebody that preserves, somebody that heals, somebody that tastes good. Oh, that sounds weird. <laughs> Let me back up out of that. Uh, tasteful. Somebody that's, that, that you like to have around. Adds interest. That's a good way of putting it. They just, they pleaded with him urgently, stay with us. Stay with us. But it's funny because Jesus just kind of just acted like he was going, right? He's like, all right. Yeah. They're like, no, 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 no. Stay with us. Stay with us. Hang out with us. Now, obviously, Jesus would know if these guys were real or not. Obviously, Jesus would know if, if they really wanted him there or not, right? But yet he kept going until he heard them. See, it's, there's something about verbalizing it. There's something about calling out to God. There's something about saying to God what you really feel. Yeah, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a big deal to do that. I think that if these guys, if they'd gone all that way with this unique stranger, and then they're just like, see ya. I think that would show a heart issue, right? That would show maybe that they, not, they don't truly know who Jesus is. But yet they wanted him. They called out to him. This question came up for me. Do you, conf- do you feel compelled to spend time with Jesus? Yeah. Like, is there something in you that just you long for Jesus? Or to, you long to, to read more of your Bible to understand Jesus? Or you long to have that time of prayer with Jesus? Are you compelled? I, I think that compelling, that drawing, that nudging, for me, it's kind of like a dragging. <laughs> but I think that is a sign of the Spirit in you. The Spirit is always pointing us towards Jesus. There's always a, a pull, right? Okay, let's keep going. Verse 30 and 31. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed them and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. They could see. They could finally get it. They could really understand. They could see their spiritual eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And, they, and he vanished from their sight. <laughs> so as soon as it's, it's made visible, he's gone. Phew. Vanished. He's gone. This question also stuck out to me this week. Do you see Jesus in life? And I mean it like this. Is Jesus the compartment labeled Sunday mornings at New Mountain Church. Is that where Jesus lives? In your little box titled Sunday mornings? Jesus is life. Jesus, is life. Jesus should be in all the boxes. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I almost forgot how many days of the week there were. Right? Jesus is in the, everything. Jesus has infiltrated every part of life. And then as you have Jesus in here, you start to see Jesus out there. What does Jesus say? If you've given water to the least of these, right? If you've given food to the least of these, if you've cared for the least of these, if you've uh, helped the least of these, what does he say? You've helped me. You start to see Jesus everywhere. You start to see Jesus in your own life. You start to see Jesus in creation. You start to see Jesus in the homeless. You start to see Jesus even in the lost. And that's what should prod you on to 
explaining to them the Gospels. Explaining to them the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It should be pushing you that way if you see Jesus in life. Let's keep going. Verse 32. Now these guys, this is what they say. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while He talked to us on the road, while He opened to us the Scriptures? There's something that happens in the heart. It's a, it's a mind thing too. Your mind understands it, yeah, but your heart, there's something that happens on the inside when you know God. There's something burning that takes place on the inside if you know God. I pray in this room that we would have spiritual heartburn. There ain't no antacid you can take. No Prilosec or what's the other one? I can't remember the other one. Zantec. They can't take it for this kind of burn. I don't want any cooled off Christians. You know, in the, in the book of Revelation, there's letters that were given to all the churches by Jesus. And he rebukes a bunch of them, but he, he also admonishes some of them as well. But one of them, the church of Laodicea, this letter goes out to them and he's upset. Why? Because they're messing up? Why? Because they're really doing awful things? No, it's because they're lukewarm. He says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. But since you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. It's a way of saying, since you're lukewarm, you're, it's like you're, you're neither things. You're, you're not hot or cold. I pray that we would be people who are on fire for the Lord, really. Let this, let this sink into your life. Every problem that opens up in front of you throughout your week, look at it through the lens of Jesus Christ. How would He act in your situation? What words would He say in response to what you hear this week? Some of you are quick to fire out the responses, right? Oh, I got coworkers. I used to have coworkers like that. I remember, I, remember, I remember how that was. What if Jesus was not only something you did on Sunday or you talked to on Sunday or you worshiped on Sunday or you heard about in Scripture on Sunday, but He was all the way through your life? You would look a lot different to this world. I guarantee it. I totally guarantee it. So their hearts were burning within them as He opened to them the Scriptures. So another question that was illuminated to me this week. Do you know why you are a believer? I mean, there's many people who just, they believe and they don't really understand where that comes from. They just kind of, I just, I don't know, I just believe. In fact, there was a, a few years ago, we went down to the mall and we were, you know, trying to do apologetics. That's, you know, explaining the truth of what we believe and and even helping people to understand the errors of other belief systems. But we had this thing where we go up to people and we'd say, hey, uh, what do you believe and why? You know, what is your faith or what is your religion and why? The overwhelming majority said, well, it's... uh, it's what my parents believe. So I say, so, so what you believe is all based on just because your parents believe that? And they'd be like, well, yeah, I mean, we, we're just, we just always believe this. So that same question should be delivered to them, but why are you a believer? Why do you trust Jesus? Why do you consider yourself a Christian? It's good to ask these questions and think about these things. Because if you're on the coattails of your parents riding into Christianity, I hate to break it to you, but you didn't make it. If you think that you can just somehow slide down the mountain of life into your family's belief system, you just hit a rock and you didn't make it. It's a personal thing. It's a inside your heart thing. It's you come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and you believe Him for who He is. You don't have Dalmatian theology. You actually truly believe what the Bible says and, and, and it's the Jesus of the Bible that you trust. Not the Jesus of culture. Not the meek and mild Jesus. Not the hippie Jesus with sandals. Even though I know He wore sandals. That's for sure. But... 
He's King Jesus. He's Mighty Jesus. He's in control Jesus. He's coming back Jesus. He's loving Jesus, merciful Jesus, graceful Jesus, and at the same time, wrath Jesus and judgment Jesus. He's all. He's, he's fully encompassed all of who God is. Do you know that one? Do you know that Jesus? Is He your God? Or is it somebody else? Let's keep going. Verse 33 to 35. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So realize, Jesus vanishes. They're like, wasn't our hearts burning within us when he opened to us the scriptures? And think about it. It's nighttime. Right? Because they said, Jesus, come in. Or they said, hey, don't keep going, whoever you are. (laughs) Come in because it's getting late. And as this happened to them, they ran back to Jerusalem in the nighttime. They ran all the way back because they knew they had to tell everybody about it. They knew that they had to find the other disciples and explain to them what they had just realized, what they had just seen. So they're they're running. (sighs) Hey, are you going to tell them? Yeah, no, no, you tell them, you tell them. Okay, we're going to tell them. We're going to bust through the door and we're going to say, guess what, everybody? And so they're running back and what do they do? They open the door and what happens? Somebody else says, the Lord has risen indeed. (laughs) They're like, we were going to say that. But then they, they told everybody what happened on the road. But it's crazy because Jesus had to vanish. Jesus had to leave. Why did he leave, though? If you were to say, if you were asked this question, why did Jesus leave? At the minute that they could finally see Jesus, why did he vanish? To prepare a, vase for to prepare a place for us? He was, he was getting ready to go to the ascension. He had other things to do. I mean, what, think, think about it. Think about it. He had, more had more people to see. That's good. There's a bunch of different answers for this. The seed was already planted with them. That's a good one, Sarah. Because think about if Jesus would have stayed, would they have gone to Jerusalem? Would they have ran back to Jerusalem? No, they would not have. If Jesus would have stayed, would they have talked to each other and said, didn't our hearts burn within us when he was opening up to us the scriptures? No, they probably wouldn't have. Jesus had planted the seed like Sarah said, and he was gone. Other theologians say this. They say, well, maybe it's because Jesus didn't look like Jesus anymore. You remember what Jesus went through? The beatings? You can get beat good enough to where you don't look like who you used to look like. And we do know that his body was changed, right? Because even though he's in his glorified body, what happens? He goes up and and Thomas is like, Oh, I'm not going to believe unless I put my fingers on the holes in his wrists or the holes in his hole in his side. Right? So what did Jesus do? Here you go, buddy. Check it out. So what does that tell us? That tells us that no matter what, Jesus' body was forever scarred. So it could be that he looked different. I don't know. I don't know. But whatever reason what whatever reason it was that he vanished, he did that because they needed to go. Think about what Jesus says. Even greater things ye shall do. You like that, Dan? King James. I put a ye in there. (laughs) Even greater things ye shall do. Well, what do you mean? Whenever I hear somebody say they're greater than Jesus, I duck because a brimstone's going to fall out of the sky and smash them because ain't nobody greater than Jesus. But what does Jesus mean by saying even greater things will we do? Because the Holy Spirit is in each and every one of us. Essentially, the life of Jesus is multiplied by however many countless billions of believers that are out there. And so, yeah, we'll do some great things if we really, really understand. And I pray that you guys would really, really understand. The only thing I want to do in life, the only thing I know for sure I want to do or I feel called to do is to teach people the Bible. I'm not called to build a big church. Don't know how to do it. Not sure I want to do it anyways. (laughs) all the only thing i know how to no the only thing i really know that i am called to do is i'm going to help you understand the bible and guess what you take it how you want it 
you either understand it, you either trust the Jesus of the Bible, or you don't. You either have open spiritual eyes, or you have goggles on. I pray that you guys would see Jesus for who He is. And that's why right now, I want to move to communion. We have communion at the church periodically, and communion is one of the two sacraments of the church. Baptism and communion. Communion is so special because this... In communion, where we have the wine and the bread, it's a way of being completely in the presence of Jesus. Essentially, it's easy to understand what communion is. Communion is almost as if we go back all those years to sit at the table with Jesus. Think about if you were that close to Jesus, where you could see the hair on his face. You could feel his presence that close to you. That's what communion is. But with that beautiful experience also comes caution. Because the Bible says if you're not a believer, it says that it's actually very bad for you to take communion. The Bible says to not take communion if you're not a believer. So we're going to start passing them out. If if you are a believer, this is for the family of God. This is for any Christian. It doesn't matter if you go to this church or not. If you're a Christian, you can do communion. Now, the way we do communion is, help me to understand, is it the middle that's the wine or is it the outside ring that's the wine? Dan? Okay, so the outside ring, the ring, (laughs) the outside ring is biblical. (laughs) The inside ring uh, is grape juice, but grape juice is not bad at all. I'm not against anybody taking grape juice for communion, but the ancient church did not have Welch's grape juice. Guarantee. What they had was they had real wine. But in, in the way that they would do communion in the ancient church, it would be one part wine, three parts water. And that's what we've done today. If you, if you choose to take the wine, it's on the outside ring, or the Welch's grape juice is on the inside ring. It doesn't even matter what you take. It's all up to you and your preference because it's the spirit behind it that's important. Before we take communion, though, we need to pray. We need to pray because the Bible says for us to take a moment and pray and get right with the Lord. If you're like me, you would need to pray pretty much for the next five hours to get right with the Lord if you were to think about every single thing you did wrong in life. I think that if, if we're dealing with something, let's pray. Let's pray about it. Let's ask for forgiveness for it. And then at the end of our prayer, say, Lord, if there's anything else in me that needs cleansing, that needs forgiveness, forgive me for it. Pardon me from it. Okay, so we're going to take a moment and pray about that. They're going to keep passing out the elements, but we'll, we'll pray right now. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we can take a moment of personal prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to sit at the table. Jesus, we thank you for your life that was lived in righteousness, your death that was given in sacrifice, and then your your everlasting life that has brought us freedom. Jesus, we have sins. We have issues. The flesh, our fleshly life can sometimes mess us up and we can be angry, we can be lustful, we can have all these issues. And so, Lord, we just pray for forgiveness. Lord, we're going to take a moment as a church right now and individually plead for forgiveness and mercy. Lord, if we have unforgiveness in the heart, help us to forgive and forgive us of that sin. If we have anger in our heart, Lord, for somebody, 
Help us with that anger. Help us to, to cool our anger and forgive us of that sin. If we have lust in our heart, Lord, I pray that you would take that away and forgive us of that sin. If we have greed or a urge for power, I pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of that sin and put us on the right path. Lord, if we've messed around with other religions or, or witchcraft or anything like that, I pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of that sin and lead us away from that. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to walk a life honoring to you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace that is new every day and it's poured out on us in every way. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So at this time, we could take the bread, which is in the bottom cup. You can kind of take it out like that. The bread is unleavened. That's why it's flat. (laughs) And it's a way of symbolizing what Jesus had at the table. I want to read 1 Corinthians 11, 23-25, just for a second. This is Paul explaining communion. To the Corinthians. He says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. So we have now in our hand the bread that symbolizes for us the body that was given on that cross, the body of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your your body that was given on our behalf. Lord, we pray. We pray, Lord, that we would really know you and seek you and understand you and then love you. But Lord, while we were still sinners, you you died for us. And so, Lord, we take this in remembrance of you in your presence. Amen. Take the bread. We can keep going in 1 Corinthians, where it says this in verse 25. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. It's always helpful to realize that the blood of Jesus on the cross was not spilt. It was poured out. It was given on purpose for a reason. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your life that was lived. You healed, you taught, you cast out demons, you proclaimed the kingdom of God, and you went to the cross, not as the end of the song, but actually the crescendo. You came to life and removed the stone, and you ascended to heaven. So Lord, we know that it is only through your sacrifice that we can be made clean. It is only through your death on the cross that we can be freed from life's bondages and the devil's attacks. We thank you for your blood that was given on our behalf. Amen. Okay, you could take the wine. I'm going to call the band up. And as they're coming up, I again want to ask if this is, came to a moment in life where you don't truly believe. I pray that you wouldn't put it off. I pray that you would trust Christ. That you would live a life that was honoring to God. That it was all the way through your being. You weren't just a halfway Christian. You weren't lukewarm, but you were on fire for God.